Good evening. I am Brother Dr. Jeffrey Sterling, Surgeon General for Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. On behalf of our General President, Brother Dr. Willis Lanza III, we welcome to tonight's webinar. I am so pleased to be with you this evening on this topic. It's actually true that um, I probably made my chops um, on this topic. So let me start by telling you a story that will frame some of the uh, conversation this evening. Um, it was uh, in at Northwestern when I was an undergraduate that we had a the guy that used to be our associate dean who would recommend career planning and all that stuff for us. This guy literally told about 15 of the black students who were medical student aspirants that we probably should major in underwater basket weaving or something like that, that um, had no chance of getting accepted to medical school. Well, since many of us believed that it was our destiny to do this thing, uh, we decided to find a better path. And um, we'll talk about what that looked like along the way and what best practices are to make that type of thing happen. But as it was um, the case, uh, we had the largest cohort of Blacks who ever got accepted into medical school. I took that story with me, and it was actually in 1989 that I actually founded the Minority Association of pre-health students. Some of you have heard of that. It's had a presence on over 300 American colleges and university, and it's the definitive, definitive um, support mechanism for undergraduates who have aspirations of becoming a physician, nurse, public health professional, or other type of um, health professional. And it was actually two years later in 1991, while I was chairman of the Student National Medical Association, that I was the project director for a national grant that produced the definitive guide at that time to tonight's topic. It was titled, So You Want to Be a Doctor, and that keepsake um, edition had a national distribution to over 10,000 aspiring medical students. That being said, we have a phenomenal panel um, that is worthy of this topic and uh, will tell you specific things that you can take with you. Two of our Deputy Surgeon Generals are here um, tonight, one of whom is a past president of the National Medical Association. And we also, if that wasn't enough, we have a medical school admissions dean. You're going to get the real deal tonight, and I will be here along the way and at the end to make sure that you get some concrete resources to take with you if you or someone that you care about is really wanting to engage in a career in the health professions. With that said, we welcome back to, as tonight's moderator, Alpha Phi Alpha's Deputy Surgeon General for Family Health. Brother Dr. Victor Narcisse is a spring 1990 initiate of the Rho Iota chapter of Alpha, and he is currently active in Alpha Eta Lambda chapter. He practices at the Houston Methodist Hospital as the Associate Division Head of Hospital Medicine, and he is the Director of Clinical Research in the Division of Hospital Medicine. He is board certified in internal medicine and in geriatric medicine, and he is a fellow of the American College of Physicians and the Society of Hospital Medicine. Um, welcome, Brother Dr. Narcisse. Let's have a great show. Good evening. Uh, today, we want to talk about a topic that is so near and dear to my own heart. Uh, we all go through this process along the way to become physicians, and every day I interact with individuals who are at various stages of, the, of this pathway. Um, today, I had two medical students uh, seeing patients with me and uh, had a chance to, to speak with them, get a little bit of their um, recent perspectives. But what I really wanted to do tonight is, is uh, speak to the experts. So the, the first uh, brother of Alpha Phi Alpha that I wanted to, to bring to uh, your attention is, is Brother Pierre W. Banks. Uh, brother Banks uh, initially started at uh, Central Michigan University where he received his bachelor's, transitioned to Grand Valley State University for a master's in education and then a, a doctor of education with an emphasis on leadership studies in 2019 from Bowling Green. He's transitioned to uh, UTMB here in, uh, in the, the, the Texas region, at the oldest medical school here in the state of Texas. And he currently serves as uh, the assistant director, assistant dean of admissions for the medical school. Quite impressive for uh, the brother. I uh, want to thank him for taking some time to uh, step away from his conference and uh, help us out tonight. All right. Hello, thank you. Thank you, brothers. And I'm, I'm happy to be here. And um, I just wanted to kind of share, you know, 
talks a little bit um, about, you know, how I ended up here. So I, you know, I actually started as actually a pre professional advisor. So that's how I started in this role. Um, I started working alongside students, helping them kind of get to medical school. Um, and then I transitioned after working with several medical schools in the Midwest to actually um, getting recruited um, and starting pipeline programs for students that were disadvantaged and then um, helping uh, students get into medical school. And so that's something that I kind of did for a while and then transitioned. And now I work for a medical school, um, oldest medical school in Texas, um, and it's, uh, it's a pleasure uh, to be here. And so um, do, do you have specific questions that you kind of want me to start with talking just about the admissions process? Thanks so much. Yeah. So I think, you know, one of the most important things oh. that we think about wanting to go to med oh, you want me to uh, hang on one second. Let me okay. just introduce Brother Bailey before other we get to too far into it. Brother Ron Bailey is our other uh, panel participant. Uh, Brother Bailey is uh, also one of the, the deputy surgeon generals for uh, mental health. Uh, he is a graduate of UTMB. Uh, so there's a, a lot of sy uh, synergy there. Uh, did his residency in psychiatry um, at, at UT Health Science Center. Uh, he did a fellowship in forensic psychiatry at Yale University and joined the faculty of LSU at Tulane Medical School. Uh, he's gone on to uh, greater and greater heights and has been uh, chair of uh, and professor of psychiatry at Meharry Medical College and now has transitioned to the chair of uh, LSU New Orleans. Uh, Brother Bailey has done so much for mental health as part of the Surgeon General Initiative, touched the lives of so many students at every age, at every stage of formation. And he's also the 13th, uh, 113th president of the National Medical Association. So we'd like to thank Brother Bailey for taking a, a few moments. So right, thanks for having me. Uh, outstanding program you're having tonight, uh, Brother Narcisse. Uh, as always, we're very thankful for our General President Lonzer and our Deputy and our Surgeon General, uh, Brother Jeff Sterling, for uh, this work and pulling this together. I'm happy to meet and work with uh, Brother Banks tonight. I am a UTMB, a uh, proud UTMB graduate 1990, and very, very, very proud to see the role you're in. Uh, there's history there. Billy Ballard uh, was in that role when I was at med school. Um, a lot of credit for what he Bring a lot of people in general and a lot of African men to med school there. Uh, tell people his uh, legacy continues. He was primarily responsible for me getting my first chair. He left Galveston after about 12 years, 88 to 2000, became chair of pathology at Meharry, remains in that role uh, 22 years later, and I was on the missions committee or the selection committee, excuse me, that, that, that got me my first chair. So uh, I owe a lot to you, Tim B. Very happy to see uh, you in that role. Uh, my comments tonight are pretty much going to be along the line of what can we do to be helpful and instrumental in helping young men get to med school. Looking forward to tonight's discussion. One of the things I'd like to just bring in terms of, of background is that uh, undergraduate medical education has uh, it continued to, to develop additional diversity. This diversity has been uh, an ongoing and uh, a thing that many are very, very proud of. The challenge of, is that the, the gains in diversity have not been shared by all groups particularly uh, African-American uh, matriculants have lagged behind many others. Faculties in the medical schools tend to be Caucasian, 63, 64%. They tend to be male, um, almost 59%. And so there isn't much representation amongst the faculty members. And uh, we're hoping to uh, continue to foster a conversation ar around these, uh, these issues. Uh, the underrepresentation at the undergraduate uh, at the, the medical student level has been of particular concern and something that gets talked about in uh, the broader the, the broader body politic. But what we really want to know is how to make sure that the physicians of the future are representative of the patient populations that they serve. There's great evidence that show that when there are cult there's cultural competency uh, amongst physicians, patient outcomes are better. And so we're, we're gonna be looking at, at, at trying to uh, in, uh, address this. But in the broader spectrum, getting to medical school is hard. Uh, in, 2020, in 2020, 2021, only about 42% of applicants 
were able to matriculate according to the AAMC. So we'd like to talk a little bit about how to go through the process, how to optimize your, your, your chances and how to uh, achieve your dreams. So I want to start with Brother Bailey and ask the question, why did you become a doctor? What was it? So, what was so influential in your decision making? Uh, my my, my um, history is a uh, very uh, traditional. I, I although I'm not from a family of physician, the first position in my family, uh, but I grew up an only child with two parents who were school teachers, and my entire life, I, my mother said to me, "You know, you're going to be a doctor." Uh, so that really and truly, I know it's cookie cutter and it's um it's very um you know out of the newspaper, but that's kind of the, the life that I had. But I was very fortunate. I, I'm a pretty big guy. And I played basketball. I, I got one scholarship with the Morehouse College. Uh, the reality is a uh, small college basketball. But a great place for a young black male to go to college and try to play sports and and do academics. Uh, I had a basketball coach that wanted you to get to the library and study and and, and do your work. I had a counselor that had me uh, take high level classes. I've got a young man works with me right now who spent four years in undergrad at a college um, here in Louisiana, played football and was pushed into classes that wouldn't get him into med school. He had to go back to college for two years and work on his own to take pre med classes going forward. So I was very fortunate. And those are the kinds of advice that I think. Uh, people like myself, really all of us, have to give to uh, to schools and universities, I think, at the uh, highest level with individuals, uh, I think, who are functioning independently, trying to find a way to work step by step along the process to get into med school. My final point is we also have a huge responsibility of uh, getting people to matriculate successfully. And what are the skills you can develop before you get in so that when you do get into med school, you do the things necessary to be successful and, and graduate on time. Those really, I think, are my priorities. It's so important is that I really encourage all the those who interface with me and ask about becoming a physician to really understand the why. It's a long, arduous course to becoming a physician. Once you get there, it's a it's a daily a daily um, challenge to uh, balance all the the needs. And so, the why your physician is really the most important thing, in my opinion. And so my own experiences were that I, I wanted to be a research scientist. I didn't actually want to, I didn't start wanting to be a physician. And I, uh, from New Orleans, I happened to attend high school summer enrichment programs at Xavier University. Uh, they have a, a series, Biostar, Chemstar, Soar, and Sister Grace Mary Flickinger was the person who sat down and said, uh, this research science is all well and good, but you could be a physician. Is that something you'd be interested in? I never even thought about that because I come from a family where there really weren't any physicians. There were very few physicians that looked like myself in my community. And so that the, the, the spark of interest was so important. And I actually carry that, that legacy forward and it's very, very, very important. I wanted to talk a little bit about the, you know, how do you achieve this? And so I wanted to go to the expert and uh, wanted to, talk, to bring Brother Banks uh, forward and talk about you know, classes and undergraduate class selections and major choices. Yeah, I think that's a really, that's really important to think about. If you if you want to go into medicine, you want to think about what major sets you up for success, but also what classes you can take. And so med school, so it used to be, um, you know, years ago, there was the, we wanted you to do something in the sciences. So biology, chemistry, um, you know, those were kind of the highest, biomedical sciences were the highest majors. Now those majors are majors that you can do that actually have a lot of the prerequisites built in. So if you're getting the Bachelor of Science in a hard science, most of your prerequisites for med school are gonna be built in, which some people opt to do. What we're seeing now though is a trend in medicine looking for kind of students that have um, not just the science pieces, but also the interpersonal and the humanity side of things as well. And so some people choose to major in anthropology, sociology, um, as long as you get the prerequisites that you need for med school, that's all that matters, right? Now, it, I'm gonna speak broadly because every med school is a little different. Um, and so there is a big push to not have like true prerequisites. So what you'll see when you go to med school websites, some med school websites, you're gonna see a recommended list of courses. And when I say recommended, they really mean you should take them, okay? Um, and so you wanna take all of those recommended courses. Um, that's what we've kind of seen in, in medicine. Um, and then in Texas, we do have actually like prescribed courses. Okay, and so in Texas, um, we do look at, we want you to have some biology. And so normally, like in Texas, it's about 14 hours of biology. And outside of Texas, it may not be 14 hours, but you wanna get your biology one and two, 
You want to take some, probably take some anatomy and physiology in there. You want to take some cell biology. You want to um, also probably take some genetics um, and microbiology, okay? Um, just so that you have a good base of biology because the biology sections on the MCAT focus around those courses. I mean, and actually the biology um, section in the MCAT doesn't really focus on anatomy and physiology. So that one you don't have to take, but it is something you want to take prior to going to med school so that you have a familiarity with the body. Um, then there's chemistry. And so you want to get your gen general chemistry one and two, organic chemistry one and two, um, and physics one and two, right? And so as far as kind of science goes, those are the courses that are required. Also, schools will usually have some type of humanity or English requirement. So that might look like uh, English one and two, comp, English comp one and two, or there might just say it could be English or humanities. And the purpose is that to make sure that you have good writing skills, that you can reflect, that, you, that you've had some access to like literature because part of medicine is an art and we wanna make sure that you kind of have that side of things too. And then some schools will have a calculus requirement or a statistics requirement. We're seeing one of the best things about calculus is that it's kind of a weeder out for school. So some schools will require it just because calculus is just a tough course. So we, one of those things, kind of like organic chemistry. If you can learn organic chemistry, we know you can get medicine. <laughs> and so that's one of the reasons we require organic chemistry. Um, and so taking harder math is good, but you don't have to. If, if math isn't, if calculus isn't your strong suit, I definitely recommend taking statistics. That's going to be probably more important for you as a physician, especially in med school. What we want you to be able to do is to be able to read articles and understand um, evidence-based medicine and where medicine is going. And so having a statistic background kind of helps you with that. But you'll see some schools require that. But those are kind of the base courses that you're going to need. And like I said, some schools are moving towards like a recommendate, recommend, recommendation. Um, outside of Texas, but in Texas, we do still have like a pretty prescribed, recommended. Our biology in Texas is pretty open. You just need 14 hours. We don't care what 14 hours it is. Um, most of the schools in Texas. And then biochemistry has become, outside of Texas, I will tell you biochemistry has become more optional. Um, in Texas, it's becoming a requirement. So you want to have at least one semester of biochemistry. And it's always recommended that you have one semester of biochemistry before you take the MCAT. Because there is a lot of the biochemistry components from our one semester on the MCAT that will help you be successful on that exam. Um, and so that's kind of how you prepare as far as course-wise. That's what you want to do is to take those courses. And then after you take those courses, you have all the content you need to be successful on the MCAT. But you don't want to take the MCAT assuming that you have that. You want to actually think about prepping for the MCAT. You want to think about like you know practice tests and perhaps getting like a tutor or taking some practice tests to prepare you for the MCAT because the test itself, you have to learn how to take it before you take it. Just like if you've done the ACC, SAT, um, it's going to be like trying to learn the test and figure out how the section of breakdown, okay? Um, one of the biggest pieces that I recommend for anybody, if you have a good science background and you feel really confident in your science, you also for the MCAT have to have strong reading skills. And this is where I see a lot of students who their MCAT might not be high enough because some schools will look at your MCAT as a total score and they'll say, hey, it looks really good. But some schools actually look at the subscore. And one of the hardest things on the MCAT for people, um, if they come from different backgrounds, is their um, car section. So it's the critical, um, critical analysis and reasoning section. And that's the, really where you read a bunch of passages and you have to answer questions about it. And if you are a slow reader, it is a very tough, part to do well on to even get to a median score, honestly. Um, and you have to have strategy. So that's one of the biggest things you have to learn. I see a lot of students take the MCAT. They do well, really well, but then that car section is really low. And some schools be concerned about that because, and these brothers can tell you, um, in med school, you have to be able to read and synthesize information very quickly and take it in. And that's where cars kind of tells us students' ability to do that. And so that's something that you really want to figure out, how can I do well um, on this card section? So that's another piece that you want to prepare yourself for. You also have to take the CASPER. Most schools are required. Well, you don't have to take CASPER. Most schools require the CASPER. CASPER is a situational judgment test. And it, they actually have changed a little bit. And so they're changing it to where there's some type of responses and then there's some video responses. Um, they're, we're actually found that with the video responses, it actually is more equitable and they're, um, 
um, the audio responses as well, and it actually helps um, with equity, and they found a lot of research with that. One of the big things for the Casper is um, if you can't type a paragraph, and I mean like having like a main sentence and some supporting evidence in about three minutes, four minutes, students have a hard time with that. Um, a lot of students, if English is their second language, they might struggle. So I, we, we work on how to just like take a prompt, like an essay prompt and write a paragraph quickly about it. Really practice getting yourself in that practice because that sometimes is what hurts students Caspers because they tend not to finish or answer um, in the allotted time. And so that's another piece that another test that you have to practice for. So a lot of people think, oh, I just got to take all my prerequisites. I apply to med school. But you see, since I talk, there's a lot of stuff you got to prep for for these tests that you got to take to perform well. Uh, on the Casper, you want to at least try to be, and it's actually not a high school. Like, uh, school every school kind of uses Casper differently. I will tell you how we use it at our school. You know, it's not a high percentage. Um, that you have to get on the Casper of percentile, if you could make it to the 15th percentile, that's good. Um, that shows us that you, you know, you have some situational judgment. We're not trying to, you know, you don't have to be 30. I get emails all the time. Oh, my percentage was, you know, 30th. And I'm like, that's okay. Um, and so just trying to think about it that way, instead of thinking about trying to like the MCAT where you want to be. And with the MCAT, you do want to be in the 80th percentile. Um, you do want to get, you know, as high as you can. Uh, but with Casper, you just want to not be below 15% hours. So it, how I've seen a lot of schools in Texas and how we look at it at uh, UTMB. Now, if you look at the AAMC data from a national perspective, they talk about a, a, an overall GPA of 3.7. They talk about a, um, a yeah. science GPA of 3.66. They talk yeah. about... Um, you know, these MCAT scores that, that are sort of mind-bogglingly high. High, yeah. And, so, yeah. <laughs> and uh, you know, and so I actually looked at both of your institutions. LSU New Orleans has an average GPA of 3.67. Uh, MCAT score 75th percentile. UTMB, 3.8. And the average MCAT score was 511. Those are, those are pretty spectacular numbers for both of your institutions. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that your institutions are very proud. Uh, if you don't know, medical schools are sort of ranked and they kind of, you think that the competition ends when you're in elementary school or in middle school or in high school. Well, even the medical schools are like, are sort of jostling against each other to be the, the highest ranked medical school. And by having higher GPA and higher MCAT scores for their, their entrance class, they, it makes them look a little bit more prestigious. So how do you, you know, what do you tell a student who doesn't quite have those grades? Or the yeah. I, 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 that's a tremendous point. And, and I think one of the values of, of first and foremost, the comments by, by Brother Banks was just outstanding. Uh, I wish every young man in the country had that, that information. I hope they'll, they'll see it on tape, uh, a blueprint to understand, I think, this process. Uh, but I think it's bi-directional. I think on one hand, uh, there's a process and there are the, 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 the targets and the goals of what you need to do. The other piece I think is our role as um, as, as those who have um, completed med school to kind of reach back and give a story to people where they brothers an opportunity otherwise that they can do it even if they've kind of had a, a bump or a hurdle along the way. Uh, I'm very impressed with uh, um, the important data that says that our black males are probably the demographic group most likely to start the process and not ever really apply. They will stop along the way or, you know, think the MCAT score wasn't high enough or have some challenges here or there. And that means that many individuals feel like they're isolated and they're along this pathway, this journey on their own and not thinking or understanding, let alone being aware of all the resources that should be there available to help them kind of complete this really monumental task, I think, for many. So that's one, I think, huge issue for us and a, and a place, I think, of opportunity for Phi Alpha to have a role to play in, in educating, I think, beyond of what is the most, most generally known. The other thing, I think, that you have to say uh, brother Narcisse, when you uh, address the fact that things are highly competitive, is that, you know, c competition changes, and I've seen that in my career. Uh, those who start at the beginning don't always end at the, in, in at the beginning. Uh, some persons may start at some point, maybe in the middle, and find their stride later on and, and keep going. So I think that we shouldn't, um, we should make sure that young people are not of the misunderstanding that you, um, if, if, you if you don't start off at the very top, and at the very beginning of the class, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera that you can never um, perform better and do. But I, I was 
surprised in May of school even since then, it says I'll find someone who seems to have had a lot on their plate. Maybe they already had a spouse and a job and a prior career, and they'll hit and get May of school and get to a place and just kind of really b b bust things out and in the top 10%. So I think the, a message of optimism I find to be, I think, an essential one, an important one, but along with resources. I think you also commented, uh, Brother Banks perhaps, or, or Brother Narcisse, that people should take or avail themselves if they can of every possible resource available. I, I encourage take Stanley Kaplan or Princeton Review. I encourage if the university has a summer program, Victor mentioned he was in one, I was in three. I went to Morehouse, I went to Brown, and I went to Baylor College of Medicine. 82, 83, 84, eight weeks, these pre med cell programs, everything I could try to get in. And I think that's something that I think young people should hear about, that those messages are there. I think very often those programs help give you almost a blueprint of what it's going to be like after, after you get in med school. So I think to me, they're very important for your success and matriculation once you're in, or you get over the hump to actually get in. Huge points I think are important for young young men to know. Yeah, I think we talked about MCAT. I think, thank you for bringing that up, uh, Dr. Bailey, because I was going to talk about how, you know, medicine, so we are trying as hard as we can in medicine and medical education to move to competency-based education. So one of our, step one, our first, one of our first board exams went past fail uh, last year, which is something that it was a very high-stress exam for our med students. And and I think one thing when you're thinking about MCAT, you want to look at, like, so I can give an example. In Texas, our average test taker is about a 501. Okay, so that's just the test taker. But those who matriculate, the average in Texas is actually a 512, all right? And so you want to take a look at kind of looking at where you're in, what's the, whatever state you're in or what state you're trying to go to medical school in. Like, where is the average, you know, test taker getting? And then what is the average, average matriculate? And as long as you're within two standard deviations of that average matriculant, you are you 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 are competent, and you are you're going to be a student that they look at. If you fall two standard deviations below that um, that uh, matriculant average, you really want to think about increasing your score. Okay, um, there's a lot of money also to be made in this game, so you want to really think about like, are you just are you less competitive, or are you not applying to the right school? Because that's also part of it is that you some schools just might not be within your reach based off of your MCAT score and GPA. Um, so I can tell you, you know, with our school, we want our students to try to be at least at like a 504. Like that's something that, that we're looking for. We have a lot of data because part of being a doctor, and they'll tell you part of being a physician is you have to take tests and get recertified. And so one of the things that our MCAT tells us, and that's what we're kind of looking for, is kind of a base competency or an above average competency in test taking. Abilities, okay, and so that's something to think about. And then, as far as GPA, you, if your GPA is is low, you want your MCAT to be higher. If your if your the higher your MCAT, the lower your GPA could be to about a three point um, two five. That's you know I would say to that. I think anything lower than that can be difficult. But I will tell you, like just last year, a medical school admissions is holistic. We took students, you know, we had a student that had a two point eight five. GPA. Um, his MCAT was really high. His MCAT was about a 5, 516. Um, but we kind of really used a holistic approach. We also looked at the student, and I think Dr. Billy talked about those summer internships. If, even if it's, uh, you know, pipeline program that you're in or research internships, those help because it shows our committee members that you are serious about this, that you've taken time to partake in enrichment activities, and so that helps. But I think for students that are struggling with that MCAT, um, if you are below the average in your state and you're like two standard deviations below that matriculant average, that's where you're going to say, no, I'm not competitive. Um, and you really want to try to work on getting two, two standard deviations within that, okay? Uh, because that's, that's important. So you said the, the test taker average is five or one. That's the 52nd percentile nationally. And when you right. said that the, your average matriculant it's in 512. 512 yeah. That's the 86th percentile national. Right. Those are high standards, brother. Yeah, it's it, it, it's very it's very high standards, which is why I talk about like you know that 504. Like you talk about 504, we even have so uh, we have a state program here in Texas, and the you know one of the lowest that we look at is a 502, um, because we have a lot of data that really shows. Because one of the things that we, we're trying to prevent is for you to go to med school and you can't get board certified because the test taking is what sometimes kills a lot of people. 
Um, and, and, and then we have people with lots of debt who have MDs, but they can't practice. So we, and, we, and the goal is for us as you know, in medical education is that you use your MD to go out and practice because we need more physicians, and especially let's talk about more physicians that are representative of the population. Let me jump in and ask, ask this question. I know all the questions go to banks tonight too, Victor. <laughs> I don't know if Texas is, is average though, guy. I think Texas is above average. It is. And it's and so you may know better recent data than me, but I, I want to give you an anecdote. When I was in med school, again, I'm happy to say this 86 to 90, the idea, the concept, the regular discussion was that all the small people were in California. They really discussed the fact that of the 200 people in all four of the classes, Houston, Dallas, San Antonio, whatever, 90% had to be Texas State residents. And I know I, I was on a missions committee uh, at least a year or two as a second year med student, and there was a discussion that we went straight by M MCAT scores, it'd be all California. I think Texas has changed. I think it's kind of caught up a lot more wealth, a lot more people invested in education, more private schools, et cetera. I, I don't think that everybody listening to this show tonight at all 50 states, um, that th th those numbers are the same. I don't want to call any of those states by name, but if you're in Arkansas or Colorado or Kansas, I, I don't know that this will be the same. That's not to be critical of those places, but I don't want to scare anybody off. I, I think that Texas is at a high, high level of how, how, um, how demanding um, you, you're recruiting highest quality people. Yes, and that's why that's why I said look at your state matriculant, you know, um, average because I think that's going to tell you if you're within two standard deviations that I think you're going to be fine because I so I did advising you know in Ohio and, and also in certain states you're going to be looking at multiple states around you too because there might only be one or two medical schools in that region and so you want to look at those states and kind of figure out what might be what might be the best state for you I think you're right Dr Bailey so we. Um, that was something that, like, in the Midwest, when I would look, I advise a lot of students in Ohio, Michigan, we look around there, and if they weren't as competitive, we might send them to other regions, and they would get into right. med school. And that's what you have to, because also other states, unlike Texas, don't have a lot of requirements. But in state, and in Texas, we do. We have to uh, admit 90% of our class has to be from Texas. And is it, is it fair to say, as the, the trend has been to move away from standardized tests, are there medical schools that don't require MCAT at all? Um, there's been talks. So some medical schools, um, there are a few that, that have moved to that route. Um, and there has been talk, you know, at the double MC level about what is the MCAT tell us, uh, why are we, you know, why are we using it? Um, but I would say that one of the, one of the best things that the MCAT does for an admissions officer <laughs> is it helps us standardize a little bit because a lot of schools, um, every, every student is coming from different um, academic background, right? So how do we put up a science curriculum from school A? I'm not going to name any schools. But I'm <laughs> school A from school B, it, and sometimes they're just not equally weighted, and there's a sense, right, in quotes, that this school is tougher than this school, and we don't know that um, for a fact. And so, for example, like some people will, like some, you know, committee members might say, oh, well, they went to this HBCU, and we don't know a lot of research that's coming out of there. So we don't, you know, but what is what does this 3.8 mean? compared to this, you know, predominantly white institution that's the research one. And so sometimes what the MCAT actually does for us is have, helps us show the committee that I am at a competency level. And, and I think that's what the MCAT does for us. And that's where I sometimes am hesitant. I want to get rid of the MCAT sometimes. What I would like to see the MCAT go to, though, is a pass fail. I think it would be more advantageous for us to see they meet a level of competency uh, because that's kind of where we're moving in med ed is kind of, and a lot of med schools are in a pass fail curriculum, so why not have the interest exam be pass fail? The AMC has started to talk about core competencies of the pre-professional students, the service, social skills, cultural competency, teamwork, oral communication, uh, uh, ethical behavior, resilience, reliability, capacity for improvement. So those, you know, none of those things really show up on the MCAT, and it's really hard for those things to show up uh, in your GPA. So, what kinds of clinical, what kind of experiences uh, do you, do the two of you recommend to really uh, inform a potential candidate about their career choice and inform the committees and their their future colleagues of their uh, interest level, their their uh, seriousness, uh, clinical. And so I'll, I'll toss a couple of these ideas out. Clinical experiences, shadowing. I get those requests all the time. Clinical research. I get those requests frequently. 
uh, you know, where do you, and where do you get those opportunities? Now, I just briefly say I, I recommend mo many multiple short term experiences. I, I think that uh, what, what comes to me even more so than getting to med school is trying to get into residency. And uh, we have the same challenges if you have a person who tries to go and do one job for a long period of time and maybe get very, very good at it. I believe is once you get into residency, uh, you're going to spend four or eight months learning that learning that trade, psychiatry and anesthesia and uh, pediatrics and other case may be, surgery and the like. I also think that um, it creates, I think, opportunities for, for relationship building. You have to kind of ask someone to kind of work in their office or in their lab or in their clinic. Uh, they get to watch you and engage with you. Uh, relationship develops. They write you a letter of recommendation. And you really want more than one of those, I think, experiences kind of going forward. And third, I also believe that I think those experiences kind of help begin to color your experience of what your 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 thoughts are going to how you want your career development to go. What might you want to do? I love your point, Victor, when you said earlier, uh, you thought you might initially want to be a full-time researcher. You end up uh, going and in, involved, and then you are now you're a clinician researcher. Uh, but I think that you have to have some experiences in more than one area to have a really good feel, and rather than just kind of saying it uh, blindly what you think you might want to do. Uh, that helped me in my career. And I, I recommend it very regularly to, to young young people who come my way. I like you, excuse me, going for going longer, uh, get people knocking on the door regularly asking the shadow. I had two of those today. And I was this program for about a decade that I call an externship, mainly with people who had some you know uh, hurdle along the way. So they didn't have a perfect score and they didn't get right right in to mid school or grad school alike. And they're trying to in some ways um um supplement their their program. I love uh, Pierre's comment that if you don't have the highest GPA, a higher MCAT can actually help. See, I agree with that. I hope that we don't get rid of the MCAT because I'm a regular preacher to people. It's a level of the playing field opportunity for me that you study more and put more in. You, you can then actually make sure you're at least in the midst of a group that people feel comfortable that they can't accept. So I thought your comments, Brother Banks, were really timely. Um, I'm probably going to steal them and use them as I go forward. <laughs> I want young people not only to be afraid of it, but to embrace it. And Reggie, you probably got to put six months of your life into it. I think that's the piece that they have to really, I think, have to have to, have to accept. No, I totally agree. And I think one thing that a lot, of, I see a lot of people who are pre-med students kind of go wrong is that they're thinking about just, because there's so many medical schools now, so that's another thing. There's been a lot of medical schools that have increased in the, in the last 10 years. Like, there's just a lot more. And what you want to think about, too, as a pre-med is what type of medical school do I want to go to? Because there are medical schools that have an emphasis on research, and so that's what they're going to be looking for in your application. Um, there's there's going to be med schools that have an emphasis on primary care and that's what they're so then with those type of med schools you might want to do more helping in like underserved clinics and volunteerism to show that you have that um, drive for community engagement right and working with community or um, underserved populations that's going to really sell to a primary care school over a med school that has an emphasis on research so you've got to kind of figure out first like what type of med school you want to go to and then once you're finished with your coursework you have to really assess which kind of med school am I competitive for? But I think that's also where I see, I mean, with lots of young people, and, and, and I'm just like, you're just applying to the wrong school. I mean, <clears throat> you need to apply to these schools, and you really want to use their admissions page. You want to look at their, you know, mission and what they stand for, and then you may be even more competitive at a school like that. And so when you think about extracurriculars, you got to kind of tailor them to what type of school you want to be at, but you do want to have a base baseline. You want to do community service. You want to show that you have a that you have a passion for just an understanding of the human experience, right? And sometimes the human experience isn't that great, and so that's another piece. Is like we see a lot of people even who do service, but they only are maybe service servicing like in their intellect. So I did a lot of free tutoring. Well, that's great, <laughs> but but have you worked with with kind of different populations, right? And that's something that's becoming very important in medicine. Um, and so just keeping that in mind, like service is very important. Another thing too, I would say, is working in healthcare. So that also helps. So we, um, I have seen um, a lot of our successful underrepresented in medicine applicants. Um, the most successful ones are former nurses, uh, former MAs, and they have worked really hard to kind of work on their MCAT, get their prerequisites, and then they come in to their interview already speaking the language of medicine, and that's more impressive to us. And so having like MA experience, scribe experience, um, having jobs in that arena as you prepare your application, say you finish, you know, undergrad and you maybe you're not ready yet and you're doing some work, those type of jobs um, will help because they count towards healthcare. Um, some schools are actually, this is 
something that we're talking about at the conference I'm at, we're actually looking at changing our application um, and adding advocacy work. Some schools are very interested in students that are doing advocacy work um, and what does that look like in the communities that we belong to, right? We, we have a lot of hours of advocacy, most likely. And so if a school is interested in that, then you're going to rise to the top if that's the extracurricular application. So uh, constructing the personal statement. So that's one of the things that I spent a lot of time uh, focusing on when I was applying. Um, we typed them on paper. You have to, you have to write off to the medical school and they sent you the, their application. So we would practice typing that application over and over and over again and hold it up to the light to make sure that it fit on the page because they actually have to fit on the page. Um, uh, that's not the way it's done now. It's different now, right? It's a little <laughs> different now. But, but the, the, the advantage we had then is that it was so hard to do all that typing that people didn't want to apply to too many different schools. Now, they, they uh, many applicants apply to, to a whole host of schools. So I want to talk a little bit about um, Brother, Brother Bailey could talk a little bit about AMCAS. Um, uh, for the banks, I know that you do the TMDSAS program and many other others uh, take a veil of the AACOMAS program for, their, for the, the osteopathic schools. Can you guys talk a little bit about the, that primary and the secondary application process? What do you like to see? How do you do it? I, I jump in briefly first and simply say uh, we're looking for four basic things as well. I think early on uh, we like you get just flooded with with applications. Um, there's generally this idea of a personal statement, and you give a bit of your story. And some people have you know this um, uh, story of kind of rags to riches, and others kind of have a story of that they were injured or their brother was injured and, and the like. I got a daughter with the, with the UTMB, and you know she uh, played a lot of sports and had no injuries, but both her siblings, both my other children, had ACLs and. She decides she will go to medicine and she's in orthopedics now. So at times it kind of plays out. But I think the second issue for, for, for me and for us, or where I am, and you mentioned I was at Meharry first and, uh, and the like as well, is, is we, we, we look for this story of how you kind of uh, recovered from some adversity. I think that's actually a huge issue. If there's been adversity, how have you managed it? Some persons uh, view different experiences adversely compared to others. Uh, it doesn't have to have been something that was monumental, but it was how you thought you. Um, should have experienced life, what happened and how you kind of got through it. And you just look at the see that they actually have some internal resolve, theoretically, to marshal the resources or find the resources necessary for them to kind of keep moving. Because I think as has been said very clearly by both of you tonight, when you get to med school and the like, it's going to be a challenge. It's, it's not geared to be easy. And at some point, you're going to hit a, a roadblock or something that's more difficult for you than you had before. So the adversity piece, I think, um, stand is a standard consideration where there's discussion around the table. A third thing, well, though, is I think I love this point that uh, if you're going to come here, we want you to be a good fit for us here. And then what, what we are looking for and what we need you to do, uh, what are the key metrics of success uh, going on here? I love the early point that Brother Banks just made, looking to see who succeeded here in the past and what some of the their demographics may have been, their life experiences. That doesn't always translate, but it certainly should be informative for us thinking about how we're going to pick people kind of going forward. So that issue of fit uh, does matter. Now, that could be a problem because historically that may have been what kept uh, diverse groups out if you weren't always kind of part of the prior good fit. So just be mindful of it. It has some utility, but it can, I think, be uh, overused uh, in an adverse or harmful way. And a final point simply is there's an impersonal exchange that very often is um, informal, that uh, either it happens or it doesn't. And if you engage with someone and you're reading what they're saying, or like if their story matters and resonates with you, you go to bat for them. That's also what has to happen behind a closed door. Somebody's got to say, this is somebody who, who should get in. I, I think they'll do well. And that's why I think it's important for us to pick quality people who are varied and diverse in everything, race and sex and gender and age and specialty and alike on these committees, because that way you're more likely to get the kind of a broad-based class that's likely to do well. Yeah, and I would just I would just add I agree I agree with all those things. I think one of the big things that we look for, you know, in our personal statements is is a story. And what I see a lot of what I've seen is something that kind of people run into is that they're writing their personal statement, not thinking, understanding that multiple people are going to read this. And I will tell you in medicine how a surgeon reads a personal statement <laughs> versus how my uh, you know faculty who's in a family medicine position they read them very differently. And so what happens is like people write personal statements and they really are trying to entice us. So they just put their whole life story for a surgeon or like orthopedic, a lot of our procedure specialties, that's too long for them. 
you need to really you really want to keep it short i usually say it should be no more than four paragraphs um and it should fit onto a page single space okay um, and one thing that you really want to translate is like you want a good hook at the beginning. And the beginning should always, you should always end your beginning um, paragraph with like the reason that you have decided that medicine is for you. Okay. And so was it, what was that moment? Was it when your sister was in hospital work, you were a caretaker for um, a family member in some way, right? And then you really wanted to like change. And then the rest of the, the personal statement needs to align with why you said you wanted to be a physician. Okay. Because that's where a lot of people go wrong, but then their personal statement goes down this path, and then I'm lost as the reader. Okay, and so that's that's first part personal statement. Secondaries have become very problematic for applicants, and I and I think we, we do have a secondary at, at UCMB. Um, one thing that you have to remember about secondaries is, or or sometimes they're called supplemental, is that you have to think about it as a way. It's the school trying to figure out out of all these applicants, why do you want to come here? Okay. And so that's where you really want to look at the school's website, their values, and you want to weave that into the essays and the prompts that are in the secondary. And you have to show behavioral-based examples. So don't just say things like, I really care about people, I'm very empathetic. Show me how you have demonstrated that in your life, right? And those are like shorter paragraphs. Usually a paragraph will do it for a secondary essay. Um, I know they've taken a lot of, this is what I, I found out after doing a lot of secondaries, that They've taken out timed writing in the curriculum of a lot of places. And what I will tell you is that you need to practice your writing skills because what happens for us is that we will get a really good personal statement that you probably spend months working on. And then your secondaries, there will just be lots of grammatical errors. There will be like, sometimes you can't understand them and it's because you're moving too quickly. And so you really wanna fine tune, but it's because you have a lot of secondaries to do and so fine tune those writing skills, fine tune, even if you have to get a proofreader or like somebody to edit for you, that's okay. Um, you know, make sure obviously it's your original thoughts, uh, but really focus on like getting those essays because that's one of the biggest things that will keep somebody from getting the interview is like, we read their secondary and they're like, oh, they're not UTMB. They haven't shown us the values that we're looking for. And like the things that we're looking for at UTMB, compassion, curiosity, culture of humility, conscientiousness, and collaboration. Those are five pieces. And what I like about our secondary that we did, our committee did this year, is that we give you seven essays and you just choose three. So you get to pick which ones you want to write about. And so that's another you know, thing that we're looking at is how well are you writing about the things you chose to write about, right? Um, and so that's just as far as secondaries. I just think the writing is so important and I know that <coughs> As sometimes scientists, some of us, like the, the writing can be very specific, like prescriptive. And it's okay to get help from people like English. Well, some of your friends that are English majors or having somebody proofread to kind of help you with the tone. Because the goal is, like um, Dr. Bailey said, you're trying to get somebody to read this and then go to bat for you at that meeting and bring up your name and bring up your story. That, that's very, very important. When I was on the missions committee as a medical student at, at Baylor College of Medicine, the, the one secret that I, I gleaned that I'd never really expected before is because of the rolling admission cycle, that there was an advantage to getting the application completed early in the cycle, close to the opening date, as opposed to later in the date. Because so I would tell you that we would, as the students on the committee, you know, by the, the, the 10th meeting, you know, you, you read, dozens and dozens, hundreds of applications, they all start to, to blend together. And the ones that we read at the beginning, just sort of, hey, that one is great. And it really caught my attention, caught my eye. And so we actually, we the students actually felt like there was an, a, there was even a, an advantage uh, similar to raising your MCAT score, your GPA. It wasn't officially, but but the, we just really fought for those people that we, we read about early and the ones that came up later, well, there were dozens of, of candidates that really looked very, very similar. And it was hard to sort of stand out. Yeah. Yeah. Cause it's like Dr. Bailey said, he, he gave the mantra like either you were sick, somebody you knew were sick, uh, <laughs> and then all kind of rolls together yeah. towards the end of the cycle. Yes, yeah, so that's exactly right. Uh, but another thing, too, is it's just by you know logic and math, if you apply later, there's just less spot because schools will start. Schools will just start giving out their interview offers. But um, at, at UTMB, we have a very equity-based approach, and I'm very proud of this. We hold and we interview monthly, 
because we do understand how costly this is for people who come from disadvantaged backgrounds. And sometimes they're working very hard to be able to pay for all these applications. And so we actually uh, interview monthly and we review every single student every month because if you don't make it the first month, we're not just throwing an application onto the side. We're looking at it again because we want to always get the highest quality applicants. And so that's something that um, we do just so that students that do apply late, it probably most likely for financial reasons or whatever reasons, even if it's work, if you're having to work a job, take care of a family, um, we we want to give you the fair chance. But like you said, math wise too, it's just, or I said math wise, I mean, if there's only 200 spots left at the end of the cycle, now you have a lower chance of getting an interview. So applying earlier is, is helpful. Getting back to my UTB days, uh, years ago, we had 2,600 applications for 200 spots. Uh, we actually have more than that here now, now, now in New Orleans. What's your number of applications there at, at, at Methodist and, and in Galveston with banks? Mm -hmm. um, you said applications or matric like spots? Uh, applications and applications. the number of spots. Okay. So we received, uh, this past year, we received over 5,100 applications, so 5,100. Uh, nine to be to be exact, and um, we we are only admitting 225 for our MD, and then five for our MD uh, PhD. So what about that on Methodist, uh, Doctor Narcisse? Uh, well, well, Methodist doesn't have a medical school. We partner with uh, Texas A and M, and we partner with uh, uh, predominantly with Texas A and M. So I, I don't get involved with the, with the, the Texas A and M applications. But I'll tell you that the student, the medical students I had on the service uh, today would would all make me look very, very uh, a shabby applicant because these these are these are impressive kids that are coming around, and uh, I, I'm more and more proud of them by the day. I, I just said earlier, but I'm going to jump in now. You made a, a good point about Louisiana. Um, I was discussing this very issue with somebody a day or two ago. It is a fairly unique place, uh, state residency, and it requires 90% like Texas state residents but it is a place where people like to stay home so one reason i think that the grades are higher the, the the entering matriculating class is probably even stronger than you might think is you don't tend to see what i certainly experienced when i was in texas 30 years ago and what i think happened in texas now where many maybe half of the top nationally top students leave and they go to stanford and they go to harvard and they go to yale and uh other places almost everybody in louisiana stays it, it really is interesting you just don't tend to see I mean, you see people with outstanding grades from kindergarten on, and they go to LSU undergrad, and they go to LSU med school, and then they come to us for residency, which is a good thing for us, but it does kind of artificially inflate the scores for a state school, in my opinion. That's so why I didn't mean to be mean to Kansas and Colorado earlier in life, but I tend to think very often state schools struggle because many of the top, top people who with the private school and high school and are like that private school life experiences living in, in middle class suburban areas in these big cities around the country, not just used to Dallas, but everywhere, are more accustomed and had other kind of life experiences to then go to a, a private college. They go to Stanford and they go to, you know, whatever case maybe on, on the uh, they go to East Coast or to an Ivy League. Um, now, one reason why our numbers are higher. Yeah, we're seeing in Texas, though, because our um, tuition in Texas for medical school is just uh, the lowest in the country, uh, one of the lowest in the country. A lot of students do want to come back to Texas, which I think is what's making it very competitive in Texas, is that we do have a lot of graduates um, who are come, or a lot of applicants who are coming from Stanford, Harvard, Yale, because they, you're right, they, they go off for undergrad, but a lot of them are trying to come back from med school because they either want to come back to Texas or they just want to come back to Texas for the in-state tuition because being a resident, and then they might leave after that. But yeah, that's a, that's a big issue. We also are getting an influx of students from the west so it because california is also very competitive to get in so a lot of students from california who don't get in there also come to texas we have a very large utah population utah um high academics in utah in the state of utah and they have a lot of students and so they come to texas so we're seeing that as well if you were I, talking I to that if you're talking to a kid in high school would you tell them that they're better off going to a, a small liberal arts school or a big state school or has to be an Ivy school or um, my Tulane University would, uh, at, at, was a wonderful experience. Xavier University at, at, in New Orleans uh, does an incredible job of, of developing young minds that, that go off to, uh, to medical school. What types of experiences are, are helpful? Yeah, that's tough. 
think that's a tough question. So, I, so I do. So I will say, from my experience as an admissions dean, you know, and, and looking at our incoming classes, I do think that you want. So I think large state schools are 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 fine. So when you're gonna you're gonna get different things from different schools. So if you large state schools are fine, but if you feel like you don't learn the large environment and you may need some one on one, that's not gonna be a good institution for you. And also at a large school you're going to have to be fighting to get into those labs for research experience. I think mean, that's going to be a fight. So that's something to think about. Um, and it's also just very, very competitive. I would say that what I've seen, though, is that our students who come from small liberal arts, and I didn't know go to any small liberal arts, as you saw my my CV, but I am a big proponent of small liberal arts because if you want individual attention um, and they come into med school, I think, with a larger and deeper understanding of science than just getting good grades, I think a lot of our state students are really good at taking exams and being able to learn the information well. I think that some of our, I would say our liberal arts students have a stronger, deeper grasp because they learned in a smaller environment. So I think that's where you see some smaller privates. Um, a lot of HBCUs have a smaller like class size and things like that. I think those are great uh, for students if you really need that. But then with that, some, sometimes they don't have big labs. There might not be big CIs. If that's, if that's the route you're trying to go, that's why I said, if you're thinking about medicine, you want to think about, because there's so many schools now, where where might you fit them? And it may be a couple, but you want to think about, like, because you might fit into a, you know, a research and maybe like a community or primary care, but you really want to think about what's going to be best for you as, as a learner. I'm, so I'm a learning scientist by training. That's like what I started in medical education doing. And I, I would say there's a lot of learning issues for students that come from schools where they just took large lectures and stuff because they they're not learning deep enough and in medicine when we teach you we expect you to learn it and and know some of the basics for the rest of your career and that the, the learning and jumping isn't going to work um, and that's that's something that um that, that happens sometimes with that i wanted to talk a little bit about the role of, of snma and nma in the development of of uh, future clinicians uh, Brothers Bailey, Brother Sterling had significant um, roles in those organizations. Could the two of you talk uh, a little bit about um, what that has meant for you? How has that been helpful? Uh, the the benefits for your colleagues, and why that why is this uh, uh, the overall conversation so needed when we're talking about taking care of of underrepresented communities? Uh, I'll jump in, but I hate to not piggyback on Banks' last comment. It's definitely for the small school, guys. It's definitely for the small school. Uh, the person of individual attention, your teacher knows you by name, uh, gets your high quality letter recommendation. I, I'm definitely a small school guy um, uh, for, for exactly reasons I, I, I think you mentioned. But I think to organizations, um, uh, Dr. Narcisse, you're percent right. I, I think that, um, um, first of all, I often think that I received as much as I gave in those settings, and I think that giving means a lot. I also think that to the, the networking that develops and watching and, and experiencing other young people do well and move on is helpful. I not only went to Morehouse, but I saw people who went to Dillard and Xavier and, and Tougaloo, you know, go to go to uh, large grad schools at University of Texas and Mississippi and Alabama uh, and graduate and do well. I think that the other piece, though, about uh, SMA for me initially was it, it gave me some leadership opportunities. I was happy to do a little research project in the blood bank and when I was in Galveston, you had an eight-week research project after your first year and went to the NMA and presented my paper and had my poster and got a little acclaim and we got presented that little poster three or four times at the NMA meeting and then a med student meeting and XYZ alike. So uh, giving a person opportunity to grow, I think that's some um, interpersonal development. I, I mentioned earlier the part about having more than one mentor, I think is huge in, in, in professional development for, for our young people. Um, and I think if you get a chance to engage in a project, there's another person who could also say, this is good, or you worked in my lab, or let's work on this project together. They may write you a letter. They may be on the, on a poster with you. Uh, they may also have some other ideas to point you in a certain direction. A lot of times in my career is that second or third person that came about because somebody early on said, hey, know this person, or give them opportunity, or work with them on a project, et cetera. The final point I mentioned is that I think that the what we hope will be kind of the continuum and, and just write a book on it between SNMA going to NMA over time, uh, I think it's part of the overall chronological development of the African American professional. Uh, and many of the challenges that we discussed I think, very articulately on, the, on this podcast tonight are, are pretty universal and people have them kind of all over the country in many settings. So when you meet together and, and discuss 
and have so-called downtime, and you recognize you're not the only one, I think it helps you kind of get out of that box and kind of get away from that um, uh, albatross around your ankles kind of holding you down. So this is kind of how these things are. Here's some strategies that others have used to find ways to succeed in spite of. I'm going to use some of those strategies, develop some of my own. But the truth is I feel confident that I can move forward. So the confidence building aspect for me was it was extreme. And then, of course, if you get in organizations and you get some leadership opportunities, I think it, it, it grows even further. I'm a strong believer in organizational supports. And I think SMA and NMA can offer that to a young African-American um, uh, student. Dr. Brother Graves. Mute. So, yeah, I was just, um, I think for, for me, what I've seen for all the things that uh, Dr. Bennett said, so I work very closely with our SMA chapter here. Um, and I have seen our students for that same reason. I mean, they will tell they will tell me, you know, I got my mentorship from SMA. So I met, you know, I turned in the first specialties. I mean, we have been, I have been fortunate enough at UTMB to see, um, and so I've been there in the three years, we have, you know, black scientists going into, derma, like, large dermatology, um, you know, I'm <laughs> going into ortho because of SMA and in the, in the connections that they've met into some of these specialties that there has not been a lot of African-American voices. And so I think it's just so important to have community. Um, and I think that's what you need in, the, in any grad program you do, if you are you know, a minority or underrepresented, is just having people who have similar background, understanding to help you through it. And so I think that's, that's very important. And like you talked about the research, all those things that I expect, it, honestly, I think that you, you covered it <laughs> very well. Uh, Brother Sterling? Can you share a little brief about the story, but uh, can you share a little bit about your experiences and and how uh, you see the this process going forward for our community? You know what? Um, there's just I, I really hope that um, the individuals that are viewing this um, hold their head. I'm actually going to take the liberty of, of doubling back to a lot of things that were said. Um, the quality of information that you have been provided, if you, a family member, loved one, acquaintance, have any interest in becoming a healthcare professional, particularly a medical student, you probably should view this more than once. These gentlemen have been dropping some real knowledge on you, and the little tidbits are so essential. I've been studying this for about 35 years now, and I actually love talking about best practices. And, you know, one of the things, you know, I, I'm going to, tweak Dr. Banks a little bit, my good brother, and and just point out that he is a, a an, an admissions dean. So excellence requires no apologies. Excellence requires no excuses. If you can do the things that he is mentioning, you will have the very best of not only gaining acceptance into medical school, but you will have the utmost opportunity to exit medical school successfully as a physician and have a very successful career as a clinician, which our people need. Because, you know, part of this, and I'm going to, again, I'm taking some liberties here, but part of the issue that you guys haven't quite addressed, the first issue in our community is why physicians are needed to begin with. And, and the issue of how to produce optimal healthcare outcomes is at the center of this conversation. As we all know, we live it every day. Black Americans suffer disproportionately from healthcare disparities and social determinants of health. The public health and medical data have consistently shown that for Black Americans, better healthcare outcomes are produced by the presence of culturally sensitive and culturally specific providers of care. And that means FUBU, Black doctors taking care of Black patients produce better outcomes. In America today, we have an environment in which only 3% of America's physicians are Black. Therefore, many more of us are needed to provide care and implement policies that produce an ideal care environment for all of us. That's why this is a, such an important conversation and why people like Dr. Banks and Dr. Bailey point, continually stress the point that get your stuff together. If you want to be serious about taking care of your people, you need to dedicate yourself to excellence. And if you do it right, that can be manifest through your MCAT scores, through your GPA. OK, now that is not close to being all the story. It may not for us even be the majority of the story. OK, newsflash, I'm going to drop some knowledge on you that 
Dr. Banks will never be able to tell you because, see, again, he sits the head in an academic institution. That's why I'm a, a community-based physician. Okay, well, let me give you something that's real. I graduated from Northwestern University with less than a 3.0 GPA. Okay, Dr. Banks just told you that there are predictors out there that says I might be a statistic that might not do well. But lo and behold, I've actually served as a department chair of three level one trauma centers, folks, over three dozen different emergency departments across the country. Academically, that can't be the entirety of the, of the conversation. Now, doubling back to the conversation about SNMA, and let's talk about the Minority Association of Pre-Health Students, since this conversation is about gaining acceptance into medical school. I told you at the outset, at the beginning rather, about how we were told by our assistant dean of student advisement that none of us were getting accepted to medical school. But what did I do? I was president of the medical student organization at the time and said, I don't believe you. And even if you think you're right, you can't be right because you aren't going to self-select my destiny like that. So I created an event called the Medical School Day at Northwestern University, still going 35 years later. And what we did is we recruited deans of admissions like Dr. Banks from all over the country. Of course, they wanted to come to Northwestern. We, the first year out, we got dozens and dozens of these guys and they came to Northwestern and they told us exactly what it took for us to get accepted to medical school. Nobody was talking about 3.78 GPAs and top of the mountain. No, what did it take for me being a student at Northwestern to gain admittance to medical school? And like I said, all of us got accepted. And I've mentored hundreds of medical students over the years through the Minority Association of Free Health Students and through my three terms as chairman of the board of the Student National Medical Association. Imagine this, any of you guys ever join a, a white fraternity or know about what happens in white fraternities where they have all the tests and they share information with each other and then everybody aces the test? Well, that's kind of what Minority Association of Pre-Health Students and SNMA are. Imagine coming to a conference and this conference exists. It's the SNMA AMEC conference that occurs every year, the annual medical education conference, where there are 800 pre-medical students in the room, where there's a thousand medical students in the room where there are 500 vendors, including deans of all these, um, deans of admissions of all these medical schools, where you not only gather to get accurate information about what it takes to gain admittance to medical school, but you see each other and you get validated and knowing that you aren't the only one that's struggling to get this done. That type of energy, that type of socialization, that sends you back to your college with a commitment to study hard, to know that others have done this before you. That's what MAPS is about. That's what SNMA has been about. And yes, in many instances, it produces the types of results that a stern taskmaster like Dr. Banks would require you. But it also gives you the inside scoop in the event that you don't have those numbers coming to the table. So what I wanna do is I wanna tell you five tips and I wanna be very practical with these things. Number one, before we even go there, Excellence requires no apology. Do all the things that Dr. Banks and Dr. Bailey have told you, and you won't have to do any of this. You will be just fine. But as you know, sometimes standardized tests don't like us very much. And sometimes we don't get the highest GPAs. And I've told this to hundreds of, of aspiring medical students over the years, and no one has ever failed me yet. First of all, it's not when you do it, it's that you do it. If you have the fire in your belly to want to be a physician, do it. Stick with it. It's not when you do it. Don't close that door in front of yourself. The number one reason why people don't get in to become physicians is because they stop applying, both applying themselves and stop applying to medical school. I think it was Dr. Bailey that pointed out point number two. There are all types of resources that are available to you, from post-baccalaureate programs that help you study for the MCATs to the Stanley Kaplan programs that get you what it is you need so that you can impress Dr. Banks and others like him. How about you play the game? How about you learn some inside tracks and be smart about this? How about you go to an undergraduate institution? If you wanted to be a doctor since you were a baby, some of you probably will put that on your letter that Dr. Banks was talking about. But how about you consider going to an undergraduate school that has a great track record in gaining acceptance? Tulane builds itself as that type of institution. Go there, okay? Similarly, know which schools have favorable policies toward minority admissions. Did you know that the University of Illinois system has graduated more black physicians than any other medical school in the country except for Howard and Meharry over the years? These are things that you should know. Apply where you have not only the best chance of going, but as Dr. Banks says, where there's a cultural fit. 
to where you can actually see yourself practicing, where you can see yourself being a part of a community, where you can see yourself not just surviving, but thriving and flourishing. That's what you want to do. We want to produce clinically excellent physicians to meet the challenges of the communities that are suffering from healthcare disparities and social determinants of health. You have to know about MAPS and SNMA. If you don't know, write this down, go to snma.org. These organizations are the largest black entities of their, their, the largest entities of their kind serving your interests. Do not try to apply to medical school without networking through these types of organizations that were built specifically for you. Similarly, and last, know what you're getting yourself into. Get to know a physician or 10. Pick them as mentors, shadow them, learn to love medicine, learn to prove to yourself that this is actually what you wanna do. It is there for the taking. You can do this. So many people, I have met so many mediocre people that have become physicians, okay? And I've known a lot of people that didn't have great GPAs and great MCATs who have been outstanding clinicians. One, as Dr. Bailey mentioned, I'm writing a book now called Healthcare Heroes that's replete with people that have been some of the most prominent names that you've ever met. If you've ever heard the story of the absolutely phenomenal neurosurgeon, Ben Carson, not the political guy, but the absolutely fabulous neurosurgeon, he will tell you at every opportunity how poor of a student he was. Again and again and again, we have to overcome. We have different criteria that apply to us and will get us through. So please listen to this broadcast again. Listen to what Dr. Bank and Dr. Bailey and Dr. Narcisa told you, but also realize that there are tricks to the trade that benefit everyone. And there are others that typically take advantage of those things we have to learn how to do those things for themselves. What I have just gone through for you is the essence of the question that Brother Narcisse said. This is what SNMA is about. This is what the Minority Association of Free Health Students is about. This is why we are so proud to be able to bring you this information with these types of experts. But remember, if it was just about MCATs and GPA, all of you, many of us would be closing the door in front of ourselves. But don't let anybody tell you, even my good brother, Dr. Banks, don't let him tell you that that's the only path forward. Because I would not be sitting here as your Surgeon General if that was the case. And again, I remember Dr. Uh, Bailey, he was on my board when I was Chairman of SMMA. And the two of us had many yucks about how blessed and fortunate we were to be given this opportunity. Because right. we knew very well and we knew that we were going to be great positions, but we weren't exactly setting pro records for those standardized uh, criteria. So there you go. No, and I definitely, I was going to say, I definitely agree. I think, you know, since my time in medical education too, I have seen students who, like you I talked about earlier, start maybe at the bottom of the class. They may not be the strongest and actually, like, they leave and they're at the top of the class. They're going into very competitive specialties, dermatology, ortho. One of my students right now, we're, I mean, he came in, he was a basketball player. He never, he told he was going to play basketball his whole life. And uh, he, yes. he's looking at 14 different orthopedic surgery residencies, one being John Hopkins. And I think that, you know, that is something that, you can do it if you put your mind to it. So it's not all about scores. Um, I think you're right about that. I definitely have seen that trajectory of, of a med student's life um, in, in, the, in the young black man. So. And I also want to point out, UC is the second to the University of Illinois system of graduating black <laughs> uh, So I will point that out. But that's Excellent. I'd like to just close with just telling a little bit more about the, the the my journey. And so you've heard tonight from leaders and mentors. Now, I've had a number of mentors. We talked about Sister Grace Mary at, at Xavier. When I was at Tulane, Renault Verrett, who's now just starting a medical school in New Orleans at Xavier University with Ashner Hospital, um, announced it just a, a few weeks ago. Uh, my high school classmates, Ryan Meyer, uh, is, was, is the current president of the American College of Physicians, 30,000 internists that he represents. The previous African-American uh, president, Wayne Riley, uh, who's now at SUNY Downstate, uh, was one of my mentors. His wife, Charlene Dewey, who's now at, at Vanderbilt, is, is somebody I call all the time when I, when I, I, need, I need thoughts and advice. My, my current practice partner, my boss, Ryan Neal, was at Meharry, he was at Xavier. Uh, these people have been my mentors. Uh, all the way through that and at every level i have to find individuals to network with to communicate with to to provide to find guidance and leadership these african-american clinicians 
are, have been stalwarts. Uh, uh, Dr. Riley is also Brother Riley of Alpha Phi Alpha. So there, there are lots of ways to, to, to go through this process. You really need to do this and understand that, that it's a mirage that people do it all by themselves. It's a fallacy that I can, I can pull myself up by my bootstraps and I did this all by myself. Everybody has a network. Everybody has a team. Everybody has a support system. And I'll tell you that you can't go through undergrad, medical school, residency, and uh, you're, you're, whether you're academic on faculty or whether you're in the community, nobody does all these things by themselves. Everyone gets help because people have done it before. You need to learn, learn from them, lean from their experience, and go forward. And tonight, we've talked about a lot. Uh, I wanted to just go, in the interest of time, we're well over time, uh, see if there's if you, any final closing thoughts from Brother Bailey, um, closing thoughts from, from Brother Banks. In, in one, one or two sentences, I'd simply say, uh, I, th I think the take home message clearly does resonate uh, that young men should continue with the fight. I love the comment that uh, Jeff Stoddard made. If, if you have, you know, that, you know, um, fire in your belly, uh, you can make it happen. I think that uh, recognizing and knowing what the numbers are, as they've been described, I think very articulately tonight by many, uh, particularly I think by the, by the banks, uh, are helpful. And that's a guide post, but it certainly is not uh, the only way to move forward. And I love the fact that uh, the comments that uh, you can always find a way to supplement. If it if GPA needs supplementation, put more time into the MCAT. Some go and do a little bit of research and get some research or uh, publication on, on their agenda. Some get a real strong letter of recommendation because they work with somebody, got a real strong mentor. But, you, but it does take an effort. This is a career. This is a, it's, it's a, it's a marathon. Uh, you're going to put three or four decades in this, if not four or five decades. Uh, so don't stop. Uh, my final comment would be, uh, if you decide you want to do it, you can do it. Push as, as far ahead as best you can. And uh, various of all resources that are available. And ask. If you ask, I think you'll you probably find additional help, additional resources to help you go forward. And I, I, we definitely need more young black men in med school graduating and, and functioning as doctors. Um, I think for me, I was just I would just like to say, you know, if, if you're going through this journey and you're finding yourself hitting hitting roadblocks, and I think when I when I people come talk to me, it's usually because they've hit a roadblock with MCAT GPA, and I think one of the best things I can tell you is that um, you may need to just evaluate the way you're learning, and and I think everybody learns differently, and once you find what methods work for you, and you actually use some like evidence based approaches, um, it will be a world of difference and thinking that you can just read a book and regurgitate the information. It's so important to construct your own knowledge at that high level of science that you're going to be learning so that you can remember it. And so just, I think though that's really important if you're kind of going through this is really think about if you're struggling in any way, um, you know, to, to get the scores, to get the academics you need, you may need to go talk to a learning specialist or somebody at your institution um, regarding like how you're learning. Fantastic. I want to point out again um, the story that I told you about the medical school day that we set up that is now replicated on a larger scale um, at the Conference of um, Student National Medical Association and the Minority Association of Pre-Health Students. The reason why 15 of us got accepted to medical school after our dean had told us none of us was getting accepted to medical school is because we knew Dr. Banks. Imagine if, as, as one of your mentors, you actually went to these forums and got to know a dozen different directors of admissions, and you talk to them, developed a relationship with them, got advice for them, follow that advice, talk to them along the way. When your application comes across their desk, you're not just one of the thousands of people that's applying for limited numbers of seats. They know you. And familiarity breeds success in this example. So please learn to play the game. Don't think that this is just an academic endeavor where you have to study, be smart, and do well on a standardized test. Really immerse yourself in a culture of learning Immerse yourself in your desire to become a physician and you'll do well. Trust me on that when we've seen it now time and again, we've produced thousands and thousands of physicians. Now, one other last point I want to make to you guys is that on a separate conversation, we're going to discuss the trend. There's a terrible trend that's going on here in a generation amongst blacks. The ratio has reversed from 80 percent males in the black medical student community to 80 percent female. And we want to talk about why that actually is the case, so stay tuned for that. Join us again in two weeks. Um, Dr. Bailey is actually going to be moderating the next one, and it's, again, a return to a fan favorite two days after Valentine's Day. We'll be Valentine's. talking about love 
relationships and mental health. Um, you don't want to miss that one. It'll be great. Again, thank you, for Dr. Narcisse, for moderating, and to Dr. Uh, Brothers, Dr. Banks and Bailey, for your fantastic uh, comments. I hope the audience um, enjoyed this. We'll be answering your comments um, in the chat, so stay tuned. Thank you, and good night. Good job, fellas.